AI is taking over sales calls with today's special guest, Ash Smith, on the Artificial Intelligence Podcast. Today's episode is brought to you by the bestseller, ChatGPT Profits. This book is the missing instruction manual to get you up and running with ChatGPT in a matter of minutes. As a special gift, you can get it absolutely free at artificialintelligencepod.com forward slash gift or at the link right below this episode. Make sure to grab your copy before it goes back up to full price. Are you tired of dealing with your boss? Do you feel underpaid and underappreciated? If you want to make it online, fire your boss and start living your retirement dreams now, then you've come to the right place. Welcome to the Artificial Intelligence Podcast, where you will learn how to use artificial intelligence to open new revenue streams and make money while you sleep. Presented live from a tropical island in the South Pacific by bestselling author Jonathan Green. Now, here's your host. So Ash, I'm really excited to have you because a lot of people have been bringing up this to me lately. And there's several different approaches to phone sales, which we're going to dive into, which is the huge difference in inbound and outbound, right? There's a whole difference between if you call someone because you want to buy something and if you just get a call and you don't know who it is. Nobody likes mm -hmm. that surprise call, but it's effective or it wouldn't happen. Before we dive into that, I really just want to get into one core thing. Like what are people going to learn over our next 20 minutes or so together? Why should they be so excited about this episode? Let's get them just right off the gate. Tell them how you're going to rock their worlds. Let me tell you a quick story. I started my first AI company two years ago with nothing, no money, no round ABC, whatever investment. It was just me, my co-founder, and I knew that AI was going to be the future. And I did that entire thing from zero monthly recurring revenue to 100K monthly recurring revenue from just phone sales, from just cold calling. And we did that within nine months of starting, within six months of making our first sale. So if you want to really know how to do that and what went into that, stick around. Fun stuff. All right, that, Anyone? I think that should have them excited, guys. If you want to hit 100K in monthly revenue, and I know some of our listeners are way past that, but there's a lot happening in outbound that's a lot changing. I've always been an anti-outbound person. I've always been heavily inbound. I've just recently dabbled and unfortunately had massive success, which is, which is what it always happens. My first two led to like result way bigger than I was expecting, like way bigger than I calculated were possible. And I called my friend who told me to give it a try. And I was like, listen, I have a problem. This company's way bigger than I thought. It's 50 times bigger than I normally work with. I'm not sure. And he's like, you'll figure it out. So you get that surprise of the bigger one, which is the classic thing that happens when someone's a coach and they tell you to expect success and then you don't. And then you're overwhelmed by it because that's why you hired them to work with them. But I want to really dive into this whole idea of phone sales because there's a couple of interesting things happening in the field. I've seen a lot of companies developing real-time voice capabilities with AI. So now there's a lot of AIs actually doing phone sales. And I wonder how long that bubble will last. As we talked about before the call, there's always a new development in sales. Like, and I think it was the development between the sword and the shield, right? There's a new weapon, then there's a better armor. Then there's a new weapon, then there's a better armor. And how long until AI salespeople are on the phone with an AI avatar that's representing a person having a fake conversation with just machine code? There's going to be, there's a bubble until that happens. We have a window of opportunity now, but eventually people are going to have AIs answer the phone for them. Don't you think? So here's what I think. First, we think about B2C and B2C, B2C sales and B2B sales. So B2C selling, I think within the next five years, you're going to get rid of every single, probably 90% of your call centers are going to be replaced by AI agents and they have their call B2C people. Because what defense do these people have? None. They're not going to buy a software. And no person is going to buy a software to install into their phone just to ensure that AI doesn't call you because it doesn't exist. They're not even thinking in that way because they're, they're, they're not buyers that are necessarily sophisticated. But then you've got B2B conversations with people. I believe it's going to be much easier to automate top of funnel conversations, B2B, than what it is to automate the rest of it. Because if you imagine a cold call conversation, the first half is pretty much always the same. It's something to grab their attention, followed by a piece of relevance, followed by why you think that's going to be beneficial for them. And you ask a question, whether that's a question of, do you want to hear more? Whether that is a question of, what do you think? There's always a question at the end. But the rest of that conversation can go in any direction anyway. So sometimes it might be objection handling, other times it might be more information, other times it might be something completely different. 
I've seen it all. I've done thousands of cold calls. I've listened to tens of thousands of cold calls from the guys that are hired to do cold calling for me. So what I think is going to happen is going to be a in combination in B2B cold calls, business development. I think that you're going to have the top of funnel, 99, if not a hundred percent AI agents repeating the same thing in the tone of voice, in the voice of the person who's going to be carrying the conversation. And then the rest of it will be that human bit. Now, the next question, and I really enjoyed when you mentioned this, the sword and the shield. I've got a sword right here because I'm always thinking that same way as well. How can you make the most of the opportunity once it presents itself to you? And I think what's going to happen is that the kind of conversations that we're going to have for a cold call and online are going to get more personal. I think they're instantly going to get more personal. But that's going to be the only way that we're going to be able to ensure that you're talking to a person or an AI. An AI doesn't swear, for example. I've tried for hours to try and make ChatGPT swear using my kind of, of language that I use, say, on like LinkedIn. And it can't do it. It cannot do it. Or it can't do it in the way I want it to do it. So it might be the case that you tell someone to F off. And then you see what the response is. And if, and if the AI response is, oh, I'm terribly sorry. Have I offended you? Or a person goes, what, what the F are you on about? Oh, sorry. I was just testing. I was just checking. And I think we're going to see more of that. I think that's going to be the human based shield that's going to come up personally. That's what I think. Very interesting. It reminds me of the three laws of robotics. Like the only way to see if someone's a person or a robot is to put a human in danger in front of them and to see if the robot yeah. saves them. I think you're onto something there, but also I can already think of three ways that you can program an AI or use an open source AI to get it to do those bad words. You can't get the big ones to do it, but there's still five solutions where we can talk about after the call. I certainly know how to do that. But I think that's exactly it is that we're seeing an evolution in communication. And there are two ways to look at it. There's definitely a bubble as in AI phone calls will work for a while. Like you can have 100% AI phone calls right now, but eventually it will stop working like everything does, right? Telegrams don't really work anymore. And you can look at it of what's going to end soon. Or you can look at it, it's raining gold. I'm going to go outside with a bucket while it's raining and jump in on the opportunity. And I think that the biggest thing I've found is that a lot of people are worried about making the wrong decision. They have this thought of what if I mess up and burn my reputation or burn my relationships. This is a very common thing I hear from businesses that are led by a face, like the person, the face of the brand. And they're like, I don't want to lose my voice. I don't want it to stop sounding like me. That's one of their biggest concerns, which is legitimate because your voice or your uniqueness is your specialness. When people are thinking about that, how do you approach with what you're creating, the things you've worked on in the AI space? To be clear, you mean how do founders go about not losing their voice? So not, they're yeah, they're still so worried. What if it doesn't sound like me anymore? What if it's saying the kind of things that I wouldn't say? That's, what they're, that's the big thing they're worried about. Like I one time, someone offered to edit my book after it had become a bestseller. And she sent me an example. And I said, wow, this has perfect grammar. It looks like I didn't write it anymore. Like you've taken away all the humanity. You've stripped it out. So I know exactly what they're talking about, which is this fear that I will turn into a commodity. I think that's one of the best ways to say it is that everyone, if you let everyone speak through chat GPT, everyone will sound the same. So I made a post about this on, on LinkedIn a little while ago. So I do most, on, on B2B, so I do most of my most on LinkedIn. And if you connect with somebody, little AI prompt will come up and it will say, oh, here's how you connect with somebody. And that has been trained based off of all of the different ways that a normal person would go and connect. And they're all rubbish. They're all rubbish. So bad. Right? <laughs> it, it, it's appalling, right? So when a person asks me that kind of question, my immediate thought is, okay, try not to think of it in terms of I'm losing a part of myself. Try and think of it as the part of the process of creation, which is the mundanest part of the process, whatever that part is for you, right? That can be automated in some way via an AI tool. So let's say that you've got a thousand pieces of content, for example, and you're posting online on LinkedIn or Instagram or whatever. You can load that into a chat GPT assistant, and they might be able to produce ideas for more content for you. Maybe you load it in with a different kind of scenario each time or whatever it is you want to do. Once it has that kind of idea, you don't have to just post it. 
you can then change it, make a few alterations. But the majority of the hard part of the work has been done. I think people mistake automation for a complete replacement of everything that they're doing. Where in actuality, I'm a big believer what Musk says here, which is that they're going to become uh, tools and companions. The way in which we do things is going to be shifted via the use of AI or artificial intelligence. And that we need to see them as helpers, not replacers. Because if we start seeing them as replacers, the quality of the things that we say and do is going to decrease naturally because it's just an amalgamation of everyone's thoughts and opinions. Of course, it's going to be watered out. Of course, it's going to go to about neutral. Whereas the most interesting stuff is actually stuff that's on the periphery or the most extreme. Whether it's right or wrong doesn't matter because it's the most interesting stuff. And that's where you want to go for the most interesting stuff. You brought up something really important, which is automation. 90% of the projects that clients bring to me, even really large companies, are actually just automations. It's usually taking one piece of data and moving it from one software to another. 90% of the projects, even when they think it's a really big and complicated project, so often it's just an automation. It's just connecting two things together. And it's interesting how we still at this phase have so many tools that don't interconnect. We have so many softwares that are siloed and they don't realize that the value of connecting with someone else's platform. There are so many different CRMs and sales call trackers that don't integrate with each other and all sorts of things like that. And it's mostly these types of issues where how do I get data from a phone call plus an email onto the same file? That's 90% of what people actually need. And unfortunately, most of the public and most of the like media about AI is the worst use cases. Having it make a video that you would, there's no way a video I've ever seen that I would watch if someone didn't first say, this is an AI video. I would just think mm. it's a bad video if someone didn't first say, this is an AI video. But that's all everyone talks about. All everyone likes to talk about is, oh, you can have AI write your social media post. And that's literally the worst use case. The things that AI is the best at, as you mentioned, are like large data analysis, organizing things, like those kind of technical processes, which as humans, they're hard for us anyways. I'm not good at spreadsheets. I'm terrible at them. So. I think that really important is to dive into the criticality of automation, which is mostly what we're actually looking to do is just connect things we already have. And then you need a bit of intelligence, which is where the AI comes in. So sometimes we buy a hammer, so we think everything is a nail. So now that yeah. someone has an AI, they go, the solution to everything is AI. I saw a project today someone was working on, and they were using an AI to take three files from a spreadsheet and separate them into three different links. I was like, that's not an AI task. You don't have to send a call to chat GPT for that. What are you doing? You can separate three files with a comma. So there's mm. so many, we're jumping right to the hardest solution right now. And I think that it's a very cutting edge time. A lot of people are hesitant to make a decision because they don't feel like they have enough technical knowledge and it's impossible to know everything there is about AI. So you brought up something very important to me that I want to dive into next, which is that you don't have to know how it works to use it. Can you dive into that a little bit? Yeah, so I'm, I've got a, a lot of very strong beliefs on this exact topic around, <clears throat> around you do not need to understand how something works in order to use it effectively. So when I was building my AI business last year, a couple of years ago, what it is that I first looked at was, right, AI is, is coming up. This is before ChatGPT properly launched in 2023, like in January 2023. This was in 2022, in around October 2022. And... I recognized that this is the future. I knew nothing about AI and I still don't know anything really about how it works, how it functions. So I teamed up with CTOs and I, and this one CTO I teamed up with, he had an AI tool and he was selling it to plumbers and roofers and builders for $3,000 a month. He just created a ways in which they could get more leads leveraging SEO. I'm not going to go into this, but that's what he did. And I recognized pretty much within a month or two of selling this thing, the trick was missing that you could be targeting these people who are small, or you could be targeting much larger companies who are restricted on the advertising they can do. So we went for cannabis, we went for CBD, we went for any kind of e-commerce store, which has restrictions placed on it, on the way in which you can advertise. Because all they can do is that's the app. So all of a sudden we were able to capture much larger SEO budgets and go from selling it for three to $4,000 a month to between seven to $30,000 a month. 
And I, again, I knew nothing about the AI. I knew everything about how to sell the piece of AI, how to structure it in a way that made sense to founders, and then ensured that how it was used was going to be effective for them in their particular kind of case study. So if you are thinking about, oh, I don't know how to use blah, blah, I don't know what to do with X, Y, and Z. Number one, you don't need to know. You don't need to really know how it all works and functions. Number two, if you have a use case that you need as some high level, like webhook based on make and everything else using chat and whatever, the call, find an expert, they'll charge you X amount of money and they will do it for you. If you really need that level of use case for what it is that, that you're doing. And nine times out of 10, they found the solution that is that, that they've got to spend the money because the time that you're going to save to do that is going to be monumental. I've, I've partnered with two AI people recently. One of them is directly in my team. And what we're working on at the moment is an AI-based conversation assistant, which can top a funnel in DMing people on LinkedIn. And we've already got it to a place where we've got 300, 400 different kind of responses based around what a person says. And that's all top of funnel. We're not doing anything in terms of the bottom of the funnel. It's all an assistant based to an SDR. And the SDR doesn't need to know how it works. They just need to understand that when is their time to come in to that conversation. So hopefully I've answered that question in an interesting way there. Yeah, that's a really important thing that I want to dive into for those of like entrepreneurs and developers we have listening is that people don't care how it works. So I worked, I started working with larger and larger clients this year, larger and larger projects. And I realized that the larger the client is, the less they care. They just want to put something inside the microwave, push the button that has a picture of a chicken and then a chicken that's cooked comes out. Like they just want it. You push the button, you get what you want. You don't care about the ingredients because yeah. let's be honest. I certainly have no idea how the internet works. I know there's a wire going from me to you, but I'm not really sure beyond if you put two cups on a string, what's happening beyond that. And I never think about that. But sometimes when we're selling, we start to think that we need to get super technical. And absolutely, that's the wrong direction because people really don't buy the mechanics. They buy the solution and they buy the story. So can you solve my problem? And is it easy? And then, of course, then there's the money question of, is it something that fits my budget? Most of the time we get, this is something that I see a lot with product creators I work with. They go, okay, I'm going to build a course. It's going to have 800 videos. I said, great. I'm going to sell you a course with 800 videos. They go, no, I don't have that kind of time. And I was like, what? Exactly. We, as we get older, time becomes more valuable. So when I was younger, sure. When I was in my 20s, I could do 18 hour days, marathon through my time was worth less than money. And as you get older, it switches. So you actually will pay for a shorter solution. You're like, can I pay twice as much for it to take less time? Go to any theme park in the world. They have the cut the line pass, right? All you're doing is paying to save time. You're still waiting in a line. It's like a slightly shorter line, hopefully. Same thing at the airport. You can have that security check pass thing. So it's very much people want the shortest solution in the least amount of their time possible. So I think you've dialed into something really important there, which is that no one's ever, there's this fear we have. And I think it's a variation of imposter syndrome, which is what if they ask me a technical question I don't know the answer to? I'll be, and what's the worst case result? I guess you don't, you lose the sale and you're slightly embarrassed. I think that's the worst thing that can happen. And if you don't call the person, you also won't make the sale. So you, the worst case scenario is you go back to the status quo is no change. There's no <laughs> negative. There's only a positive, but we create this fear in our heads. And I think, but you know what? Yes. Yes. But you know what? I've been in situations before same way as you, where people have asked me technical questions. And the way I respond to technical questions that I don't know the answer to is very simple. I go, you know what? That is a, and that is a, I don't have an answer to that question right now, but give me a couple of days. I'll find it for you and I'll come back. And that's so much better than doing a load of BS and, and saying something that isn't right or not. And mo more often than not, most people are happy with that answer. They're happy with going, oh yeah, it is complicated, it's technical. Uh, fair enough. I actually think it's gotten easier with AI recently because you can go, listen, there's been a bunch of updates in the past week. I have to check what's the best solution right now because things have changed. So it's actually yeah. even easier and it's completely reasonable because I guarantee that probably since we started this call, there's been some change. Someone's posted a new story. Some tools changed. There's been some revolution, some new different like Sora killer or ChatGPT killer or whatever. There's always something that's killing some other AI tool out there. So I think that 
you're exactly onto something. We have this fear of the delay. Like you have to have the answer instantly. But how many times have you asked for something and they told you, okay, great question. I'm going to find out and get right back to you. Or I want to make sure I give you the best answer possible. So I'm going to double check it. And we never get upset as long as you, I believe you just have to have that element of honesty, like you mentioned, which is great question. Let me make sure I get you the right answer. Give me two or three days because I want to get you the best answer possible. And it's impossible to actually know the answer to every question before someone asks it. So when I was younger, in my teens and 20s, I would write down phone scripts for every time I would get a lady's phone number, I would write down what I'm going to say first in every possible response. I'd write down this massive flowchart, entire A4 piece of paper. Every single time, first question, they would give me an answer that wasn't on the chart. And I would be like, what are you doing? You've gone off the chart. You've gone off the grid. We don't have an, I don't, we don't have an answer for that. And that's the point is that no matter how much we prepare, people are going to surprise us. I remember one time I called and her brother answered and I go, no, you're not supposed to answer. It's not on the chart. What are you doing? I don't know what to do. And one time I called and she goes, I'm in the car driving right now. And I go, I don't know. And of course the call ended in disaster because I didn't know what to do anymore. And it was very awkward. Young guy didn't know what I was doing, but we can, the real skill is the ability to adapt when someone asks a question we're not ready for. And the cool thing is the answer to every question we're not ready for is the same, which is that's a great question. I'm going to find out the answer. I'll come back to you in a couple of days. I want to make sure I give you the best answer possible because no one's ever asked it in that way before. And now it's... You a know, and you, you raised two very interesting points there, and I want to address both of them with you. Um, the first point you raised was around people, business owners, people that you sell to, or people that you helped buy, paid you not care. They're not giving rat's ass around how it works at all. And if you go, and there's levels to this, right? The first level is features and benefits selling. And you see this all the time. They say, what, look at this feature, look at this benefit of using our product. Why is that useful? I don't care. I just don't care. Next level up is solution. So you start to, you start to want to tailor it a little bit more towards what a person is going through, what you think they're going, the relevance to them. That's solution-based selling. Then you have next level on that. Then you realize that actually this entire conversation isn't in the vacuum. It's in a relationship. And this relationship can then lead you on to other kinds of deals happen in the future. And of course, it's the relationship that's formed. And then finally, the very one at the very top, which is I try and do all the time, which is from a very good friend of mine called Charles Green, is trust-based selling. And trust-based selling is actually putting the relationship first, or what we call it's being, being long-term selfish. So that short-term, you are putting that person in front of you, always thinking about them. Because in the long-term view, you know they're going to buy from you. So that's the first thing I wanted to mention around, yeah, you're right. They don't care about how it works at all. Only care about how it's going to help them. And the more successful a person is, the less they care about how it works and how it functions. But that's just how it is, right? Um, second thing I wanted to say on what you were talking about was that when we were building, when we were in this AI-based company, there wasn't any of these bots or any of these tools that we can use now. And they're coming at every single day, every single day, accelerate. We didn't have any of them. It was all just doing the work right there. All of them young guys, all of them under the age of 25, putting in the hours in, putting in the hours. And now we're at the point, I'm 36 now, so I'm still young, where I'm looking at this, knowing everything that I know, I'm going, hold on a minute, I don't actually have to put in X number of man hours when I can get this AI to do. And I'm being forced to ask myself this question. And this question is, what am I doing all of the work for? Because when you're actually in it and you're doing 80 hour days, you're not really thinking about what it's for because it's so obvious to you that you're doing it for the money or the paycheck, which leads to the car or the house or the wonderful wife, blah, 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 blah. It all just goes on. But when you've got a tool which does 56% of that work for you and you're left going, I'm waiting for this thing to work and do its job, what am I going to do? You then start thinking about how does AI fit into our lives? in the future and what's it going to do for us. So what I find so interesting, Elon Musk's sort of AI robot that he brought out early last week, that's going to change so much in a in person's life. I can't, even, I can't even comprehend it. I think that a lot of people are thinking of AI as this massive replacement for everything they do. But really what it does is it replaces the things that 
are non-revenue generating tasks, the repetitive tasks, the least important tasks, the magic of you. Like I've been in this business for a long time. In the what I do, either online business building, coaching, teach, creating courses, all sorts of things. And it, everything I do is a commodity. The specialness is not my, I'm not the only person who teaches AI. I'm not the only AI podcast. What makes me different is my story, my personality. And it's so often the part of yourself that you like talking about the least, that's the people's, that becomes people's favorite part of you. And it's because we connect with like the underdog or people going through a struggle. The magic, like you're not suddenly becoming a commodity. We've all been commodities for a long time. We just don't realize it. The things that AI replaces are not your specialness. They're the things that you spend time doing. So many people think the best use of AI is writing emails for you. It's not. It's better to have it sort out which emails you need to respond to personally and which ones don't matter. When I do that, instead of going through 100 emails a day, I go through five. And that means I have the time to write the personal answers to the ones that matter to the ones that are family members or people, friends or big business deals. I want to make sure I write a personal answer to those don't need an AI answer. And that's the shift in mindset that I really want to encourage people who are listening to the show and thinking about the evolution of AI. It's not replacing people. It really is just a smarter version of existing tools. It's a smarter word processor, processor. It's a smarter calculator. We had the same fears in the seventies when they used to say, if we let kids use calculators at school, they'll never understand math. And now it's like, you have to use a calculator for tests it's switched. So same thing when they talked about having access to the internet. And now everyone's allowed to use the internet when they're doing research for their papers. There's been such a shift. And we just have to see this as just another shift and that we can either be a step behind or a step ahead of everyone else. And so I think this has me really excited showing that it's not the technical part that really matters. That's the least important part. What really matters, and I love that you dialed into this, is finding people that need the solution and then just explaining how this tool solves their problem. And you can, of course, as you get better at sales or start to build relationships, you move into relationship selling, trust-based selling. And I really like that you brought up the long-term sales thing. There's this idea that a lot of people have who are not salespeople, which is that it's all about the hard sell, that you have to close on that phone call. And if you watch movies like Boiler Room or Wolf of Wall Street, yeah, it's all about hard selling people before they realize they've made a terrible decision. But that's when you want to have a single transaction relationship. And if you have a recurring product or you want to have a business that grows, you have to have long-term relationships. You can't be constantly acquiring new customers to replace all the ones you're losing because then all you're doing is treading water. So I think this is a really good lesson for people out there, which is that we're using AI to accelerate and to help us to do things. But the magic that's us is still part of the process. You raised a really interesting point about the boiler room and the one-time transaction. There is extremely bad press around what selling is. I don't even really call it selling. I call it selling to people that... There's so many connotations on what selling is. These days, I just say, I help a person to buy. Help a person to buy. Because... Well, Selling, by its very nature, the focus is on you as a salesperson. Whereas if you're helping someone to buy, now the focus is on the prospect or the client or the customer, and which is where your focus should be. It should always be on them. It should never be on you, no matter what it is you do. Something that I, one of my biggest pet peeves is when you're in a sales call. I don't want sales calls a lot because I like look, looking at the tech. I like helping people. I want them a lot. And the owner thinks he's getting fancy and smart when he starts telling a story. And this story is all about how they have helped this customer with X, Y, and Z problems. And it's because of them that the customer's doing so well. And every single time I go, oh, God. Because if you look at any really good movie, any really good movie, where there's a hero and, and, and they're doing a big quest, there is always a, the hero who is important and there's the helpers. And what movie do you know where the helpers go? It's nothing to do with you. It's all to do with me. It never happens. Yet you see it all the time in sales, in, in sales calls where they try to tell these stories. It should be reversed. Everything we do in sales should be reversed. It should always be about the customer. Always be about the prospect. Always be about the client. When you're telling a story, it should be about what you enabled them to do. What they have done with your help. And should be focused on them then. Same for AI. Same for artificial intelligence. Right? If you are going to be using it, or for example, what I do is that I help 
B2B AI tech companies get, get more sales, get more awareness because a lot of CTOs are struggling when it comes down to the sales component. And I keep saying to them, look, what it is that you've got versus how it's going to be useful for the market are two very different things. For Altera, a, a really interesting thing I talked to early seed level invest, early, early investment round tech owners, which is what you should do is that you should have an end point, like we should all have, aim for that. But as you go through certain points in your tech development cycle, each point should solve a particular challenge for a particular group. So that by the time you've gone through A, B, C, D, E, and you reach the end, you've now got a base of 100, 200, 300 different customers, which are now using your end product. Because otherwise what you're doing is that you're, you're developing and you run out of money to go for the seed round. Developing, more money, more, more seed round. And that's what these AI companies are doing. What they're doing is that they're producing something which fulfills a task or fulfills a job. It's part one. It gets traction. They use that traction as a way to get more investment or more funding. And they do exactly the same thing for two, three, four. And a lot of these SaaS, other tech companies haven't caught up to that kind of way of thinking yet. It's not in B2B yet. And it should be. And I'm encouraging so many tech companies to follow that way of doing it because they're going to be in a much stronger position afterwards. I think that's very clever. Mm -hmm. There's so many things happening in AI that, and there's so many tools coming out every day. Even if you just try to keep up with product hunt, I checked one day, there were 97 products announced in one day that all had AI in the name. That didn't even include the AI tools that didn't have it in the name. So it's impossible to keep up. And I think the biggest challenge for a lot of these new companies that develop really cool things is getting noticed. That attention is the big challenge because the noise, unfortunately, is all on the things that are interesting. There's almost an inverse correlation between how interesting something in AI is and how, unuse how useful it is. AI video is very popular. Everyone likes to post about it. I know if I post an AI video, I'll get 50 or 100 times more views than if I talk about a useful topic, unfortunately. And so there's always this pressure to put out what people want rather than what people need. That's the challenge. And for companies that are doing the most useful things, like the things that I think are going to move the needle the most is like data organization. That's the most important thing is every single one of us has been looking for something the past week, whether it's a picture or a file or a video on our computer or a share drive. Every single, that's like a universal experience of something was missing. What did I call it? I forgot what I named it. And you have to go look to a past conversation where you mentioned it. That's not exciting, but golly, is that a game changer because that will give you so much time. And everyone loves to talk about turning long videos into short videos. Okay, a little bit useful, but compared to something that can save you, already you can get a VA or there's already tools that do that. So it's like increment, we're at the point of incremental revolutions. But the things that really matter is, yeah, what if you only saw the important emails? What if you never, just imagine a world where you never got an email you didn't want ever again. Like that's like a magical world, like a world with no spam emails. Or imagine if you went on Google and typed in a search and you just saw what you were looking for and not 50 ads. Like the world we want is basically the world of the late 90s. <laughs> like it's actually, all we're trying to do is go back 25 years into the past before everything was filled with ads. When you typed in a search, you would actually just get whatever the most relevant result was. And we're just trying to go back to that. It's interesting. So I love what you've shared today. This has been an amazing episode. Thank you so much for spending time with us. Ash, where can people connect with you, find out more about what you're doing, see the cool projects you're working on? I know you have a whole bunch of different businesses cooking. I definitely did a little deep dive on your LinkedIn before the call. Is that the best place to find you? That is the best place to find me. LinkedIn. LinkedIn is the best place. I don't have a website. I don't see the point. There's just so much going on. It just changes so rapidly. So yeah, LinkedIn is the best place to find me. I post all the time there. I'm on there lots. If, if you're a European, then I've got WhatsApp. My numbers should be on the LinkedIn. If you're an American, then you can just LinkedIn me. I guess I know you guys don't use WhatsApp. So yeah, no, LinkedIn is the best place. And it's been a pleasure, Jonathan, honestly. Thank you so much for inviting me on. Great. Thank you so much. I'll put that in the show notes. And if you guys are watching the video on YouTube, the link will be right below this video. Definitely make sure to see what he's posting on LinkedIn. It's very clever. And it's worth connecting. Well, thank you so much for being here today, Ash, for another amazing episode of the Artificial Intelligence Podcast. Thanks for listening to today's episode. Starting with AI can be scary. ChatGP Profits is not only a bestseller, but also the missing instruction manual to make mastering ChatGPT a breeze. Bypass the hard stuff and get straight to success with ChatGP Profits. As always, 
I would love for you to support the show by paying full price on Amazon. We can get it absolutely free for a limited time at artificialintelligencepod.com forward slash gift. Thank you for listening to this week's episode of the Artificial Intelligence Podcast. Make sure to subscribe so you never miss another episode. We'll be back next Monday with more tips and tactics on how to leverage AI to escape that rat race. Head over to artificialintelligencepod.com now to see past episodes, leave a review, and check out all of our socials.